Welcome everybody uh, to this webinar on the future of cities in the aftermath of COVID-19, organized by the Center for Development Economics and Sustainability at Monash University. Um, it's part of a series of webinars that uh, we are running uh, over the next uh, three weeks or so we'll have uh, one on uh, the uh, on the impact of COVID-19 and economic issues in Southeast and East Asia, uh, followed by one on trade tensions uh, in and the global trade pro prospects with particular uh, focus on the trade issues in this part of the world. Uh, we will have uh, ex-trade minister Craig Emerson, uh, World Bank chief economist uh, I did for the region, I did come up to and uh, Mia McKeek from the UN uh, SCAP for that one. Um, and then that will be followed by uh, second of June, I believe, uh, July. Uh, the two ex uh, chief economists of the IMF and the World Bank, uh, Kaushik Basu and uh, Raghuram Rajan, I think for the first time coming together to uh, talk about how they view the prospects for global recovery, uh, the global economy and, and, and recovery. So this uh, one, we are very pleased to uh, have a, a very distinguished uh, panel, um, including uh, a very distinguished moderator. Um, so twice, uh, Professor Rodney Maddock, uh, who will be, is the moderator, will uh, do the introductions to the panel itself, but uh, I would like to introduce uh, Rod to the audience uh, first. Uh, uh, Rod Maddock uh, has been both in academia and in the private sector and the public sector. Uh, he, was, he has been a professor of economics. Uh, uh, he has been the chief economist, uh, the Victorian government, government head of strategy in, for the uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, uh, Chief Economist, uh, Business Council of Australia, uh, and uh, member of the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. So he has been involved in a range of uh, activities um, which have to do with uh, economics, finance, and uh, with uh, planning issues. Uh, and in recently, um, while he's now uh, visiting, uh, not visiting, sorry, uh, Vice Chancellor's Fellow at uh, Victoria University. Uh, he's also involved heavily in planning strategies for Western Melbourne region. Uh, so he's uniquely uh, qualified and to lead this discussion on the future of cities uh, after COVID. Uh, Rod, over to you. Thank you, Cicero. Too generous as always. Um, I'll just start with the structure of the conversation, if I can, please. We're going to run through with our three panelists uh, interacting, speaking individually and then interacting for about an hour, after which we'll have time for questions, a Q&A session running from about uh, five o'clock in Australian time through to about 5.30, so roughly half an hour. And uh, we'll be actually taking the questions uh, if you'll send them to us, and then we can, um, we can do them in sequence or, or gather them together as appropriate. Uh, that's the mechanics. Um, I gave a couple of guidelines to, to the speakers. We were all obviously very concerned about the impact on cities of COVID. Uh, most of the immediate uh, disaster areas have been in big, densely populated cities. And I mean, historically, that's been one of the, the factors which has always worried 
and, and humanity about close proximity of in cities is that there are really bad contagion risks. And that's sort of one of the lessons which I think probably we'd all forgotten, or most of us had forgotten, but which has become very clear. And to some extent, it's undermined some of our thinking about why we are in cities. And especially having occurred at the same time that the technology has changed, so that some of the rationale for actually having people all live in cities uh, together has changed as we're more able to, as we are today, talk to each other uh, at a distance rather than all having to be in the same forum or something. So it's a particularly interesting conjunction of a period in the world where we've become much more urban at the same time that we've been struck by a very severe uh, pandemic and at the same time that we've got new technologies opening up new possibilities. So that creates a whole range of, of of fascinating questions, uh, partly around how we respond as individuals, but also about how policy responds in terms of transport planning, city planning, urban design, uh, all those sorts, all those sorts of issues. I mean, I think somebody wrote here in my notes: uh, "Do we need cities at all?" is sort of a question which we probably would not have asked uh, even five months ago, let alone five years ago. Um, so it's a it's a it's a fascinating question. Now we have a wonderful panel of people to, to talk to you. Um, the, the lead speaker will be Tony Venables, who I remember as being one of the co-creators of the new economic geography. Sometime in the 90s, I think in the 1990s, probably for Tony, it was the 1980s or 70s, uh, there was a whole transformation of how we think about how economic activity takes place in space. And Tony and, and Paul Krugman were two of the people who actually invented that whole literature and that whole deep thinking about sp uh, space in a way that economics tended not to have done before. So Tony's currently a, a professor at Oxford University, director of the Centre the, for the Analysis of Resource-Rich Economies. He's a fellow of the British Academy and of the Econometric Society. He's been chief economist to the UK Department of International Development, professor of London School of Economics, research manager and trade research at the World Bank and advisor to the UK Treasury. So wonderful, deep understanding of the analytical structures that we, we're working within. Uh, I'm just going to go on and introduce the other two speakers before I pass to Tony to, to talk first, if that's, uh, I guess I will anyway, I'm the chairman, I can choose. <laughs> the second speaker will be Dr. Nadim al -Hake. From the, he's a Vice Chancellor of the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, who's been working heavily on issues of cities and urban planning, especially in developing economies. He's previously been Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of Pakistan and has a long career at the IMF, including as country resident in countries like Egypt and Sri Lanka. So a deep and wide understanding of the issues in developing, developing economies. He's a graduate of LSE and Chicago universities, written extensively on macroeconomic issues and policy issues in general as they affect developing countries. Now, John Twaits, a third speaker, has a really different perspective. I first met John, when I first heard of John, he was actually the Lord Mayor of part of our city. So he's the one person here who's actually had to deal with a lot of these sorts of problems at a very practical political level. Then he became a minister in our state government and was minister for about 10 different things, John. Climate change, health, planning, environment, and water. So he's a very flexible minister, as well as one who's deeply interested in these issues. Currently, John is professorial fellow at Monash University and chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. So he's got a very interesting perspective on what we're studying in terms of looking at the urban aspects, especially from a sustainable development point of view. He's, on the chair, he's also chair of the board of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, co-chair of its leadership council, and the strong interest and expert, expertise in planning and, and sustainable cities and sustainable, sustainability issues more generally, I think, John, if I, if I can put that correctly. So that will be the sequence. Tony will speak first, then we'll have Nadim, and then we will have uh, John. And after that, we'll have some interaction between them, followed by your questions. So over to you, Tony. Good. 
Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for that kind introduction. But I'm going to add something to it, Rod. I also have a, have a part-time position in the economics department in the business school here, here at Monash. Um, oh, indeed. The university. I should have said here since I've been in England now. <laughs> they're there at Monash University. Uh, and indeed, we're visiting there until very shortly uh, before, the, before the lockdown. But I did return to England just um, as, as things were freezing up. Uh, at the, the, the end of March. Okay, well, as, as, as Rod has said, I mean, cities have obviously been at the center of, of the pandemic. Um, and historically, yeah, cities have suffered contagion, disease, plague. Um, and because of that, there's, I, mean, I, th I think we've all read the newspaper articles saying, oh, uh, yeah, cities. Uh, the, the resurgence of cities is, is, is over, cities will become less important. Uh, I think Rod said, do we need cities? Um, well, I'm an optimist. I think we do need cities. Perhaps even more than that, I think we want cities. Um, I think people like cities. There are you know, amenity reasons as well as, as, as well as important productivity reasons. Um, what I want to say, um, well, first I will try and keep short. Uh, hopefully successful. Um, it's going to be highly speculative, I and mean, it would be great if I could be uh, giving you facts and things. It's one of more comfortable talking if there's some facts I'm talking about. Um, but obviously, there are an awful lot of known unknowns in this area. Um, so it's going to be short of facts, um, but highly speculative. Uh, but let me try and give you an idea of how I think about things and um, what. Uh, and some speculation about how things will, uh, will pan out. Um, I want to address two. The way I'm going to go through it is thinking about two sorts of questions. First, what has changed and what has not, as importantly. And then, second, drawing implications out of that for. Um, uh, for, for uh, and I'm hesitating here. I'm getting quite a lot of feedback. So forgive me a moment while I turn my speaker right down. Uh, so I won't be able to hear anything now, but fortunately I won't be able to hear myself with uh, half a second delay, which is <laughs> a lot pleasanter if I'm not hearing myself. Um, so I, but I won't be able to hear anything from you either. <clears throat> okay, so first, what, 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 what's changed uh, with this? Um, now, actually, first, let me say I'm going to be speaking from the perspective of sort of eight, 18 months, two years out. So on the basis of um, things basically working again, you know, lockdown basic, basically uh, being, being over. Um, now, obviously, that is hugely speculative. Um, yeah, maybe we'll have a vaccine, I hope so, but you know, 18 months, two years, probably not. Um, but even if we don't have the vaccine, I think we'll have learned a huge amount about the disease and how to treat it. Um, you know, obviously, people started off treating it quite inappropriately um, with learning how to treat it. Um, all the lockdown things, um, we will learn that 90% of the lockdown things we've done are completely and utterly useless and 10% are really valuable. Um, we will learn how to do proper you know, testing and tracing and contacting and all that. So, so from a perspective of, you know, I'm going to be you know, assuming a perspective um, sort of 18 months, two years out, where things are basically working again. You know, transport, public transport is working uh, and people are, are, are back in offices. Okay, so, so one, from that perspective, you know, what's, what's going to be different? What, what's, what, what's going to change? Let me just run through a list of the sort of, in, in economic speak, you know, the, the capital stocks, the sort of state variables. You know, some things will have changed, others won't. Let, let me run through three or four things. First, yeah, the physical capital stock, yeah, buildings uh, in particular, if we're thinking about cities. Well, they won't have changed. And that's, you know, people forget that. These are very, very slow moving objects. Uh, the, the built structure of, of houses, offices, factories, uh, they won't have changed. 
I mean, a little bit of physical capital would have been destroyed, but really very, very little. Um, you know, theatres uh, were there three months ago. Yeah, that structure is going to be there in, in two years' time. Uh, and some of the houses and offices. That won't have changed. So that's one. Uh, technology, will that have changed? Well, probably not. But we will have learnt, yeah. we will have adopted a set of technologies that we were adopting very, very slowly. Uh, and clearly there's been a massive acceleration in the adoption of the technology that, that, that we're all using now. Um, and we know from the literature here that you know, radical new technologies sometimes take decades and decades and decades uh, to, to really be adopted. You know, the classic studies are about electrification, uh, where it took people 50 years how to discover how to uh, redesign a factory to make use of small electric motors. Um, well, clearly adoption of you know, ICT, remote, um, things like this, Zoom, has been enormously uh, accelerated. Uh, and that's, that, that's fantastically important. But what have we really learned about this? I mean, you yeah, know, remote working. Uh, is, to what extent is it going to change the way we work? Um, my view on this is that, yeah, we, we thought, you know, we, we were amazed that Zoom worked at all, um, as well as it does, when, when we started using it, you know, three months ago. And now, frankly, we're pretty disappointed. You know, I think we've probably all had difficult meetings. Um, when I was part, part of a, a bit being interviewed for some big research grant uh, the other week and came out of the interview so flat because it was all by Zoom and absolutely no feedback. I thought it was a disaster. We got the grant, so um, it worked. But you know, face to, the, the fundamental point here is face-to-face -face interaction uh, remains really, really important. You know, the um, behavioral economists tell us that um, building trust uh, requires face-to-face. -face. The, um, the, the behavioral psychologists tell us that, I mean, there's, there's one claim because that's how they measure it, um, that you're, you're getting 30% of the information from me now that you would be getting uh, if, if I was in the flesh because you're not picking up body language and nuance and things. Um, and I'm not getting feedback from you, so I have no idea uh, what's, what, what's going on on your side. So all the face-to-face -face things remain important. And above all, you know, serendipitous meetings, um, creativity that comes out of talking to people in the side of the meeting, not in, not in the meeting itself. Um, an FT journalist, Julian Tett, put this very well. You know, she was working from home and said the thing she'd lost was peripheral vision. You know, you can focus on some things, but you're just not getting the, yeah, en enough feeding. Um, it just not having those communications and in interactions. So we've got these technologies, they're obviously being adopted faster than they otherwise would have been. Um, does that mean we're all gonna to wanna to work from home? Um, I suspect not. I think from the employee's side, um, you know, people will love working at home a couple of days a week. Um, people will be very happy to be more, to have more flexible hours. Will they wanna work at home um, all the time? Absolutely not. So that's from the employee's side. And from the employer's side, you know, there are, you know, the employer wants the benefits of face-to-face uh, -face -face meetings. There are certain functions like training, bringing on new staff, inducting staff that you cannot, I can't conceive of being done remotely. Um, so my guess, I mean, you know, some people talk about this as if it's binary. You know, you're either working at home or you're working in the office. I imagine the way it's going to be is that it'll be great. We'll work at home one or two days a week, flexible time, and we'll go into office two or three days, into the office two or three days a week. So, so I want you to hold, hold that in your head. So I'm going to come back to the implications of that in a moment. Okay, so uh, physical capital buildings are unchanged. Technology, yeah. we, we've adopted, um, we've heard my views on that. Well, what, what, what else would have fundamentally changed? Well, okay, firms, firm, firms, firm, firms capital, their financial capital, their organizational capital, uh, their human capital, have obviously, there's been, clearly, clearly, been, clearly been a loss of income uh, and debt and damage uh, to some, some, of, some of that capital. 
And the numbers here are pretty scary. I mean, there's a US study. Again, I've got no idea how they got the numbers, but it came is that if the lockdown went on for six months, then 15% of restaurants would be left standing at the end. Even in the finance sector, only 60% would be left standing at the end. So that's a massive uh, wipeout of organizational capital and presumably some human skills uh, with it. Um, well, that was if it lasts six months, it won't last six months. But the point I want to make here is that the policy response in this area is obviously absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, yeah, there's been a loss of revenue. Yeah, for firms have experienced a loss of revenue. There is debt. Uh, who's best able to bear that debt? Is it a small, medium enterprise or is it government? Well, evidently it, it, it's government and on the whole governments are stepping up to, to, to take on much of that debt. But I should add on that, you know, if the firm's income stream has dropped, uh, it's not paying workers, it's not paying shareholders, it's not paying owners, it certainly shouldn't be paying landlords either. Um, you know, these are all you know, the, the inputs to production, you know, land is one of them, you're not paying your suppliers, you're not paying your workers, well, don't pay a landlord. Uh, but anyway, uh, um, obviously contracts are written in ways that make, makes that difficult. But I see no reason why landlords should be paid. Okay, physical capital, technology, firms capital. The, the, the other thing, the, the other thing that you know, might or might not experience a permanent change uh, are people's attitudes. And of course, this is the really difficult one where I have um, no 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 particular insight whatsoever. Um, clearly, there's some some risk aversion. Uh, people reluctant to you know, get on public transport. Um, my guess is that will fade away pretty fast. Um, I did spend a weekend in, in in trendy areas of London and saw no evidence whatsoever of, of, of risk aversion or social caution against the young younger people um, in, in, in in London. So maybe there'll be attitude change, but my guess is it'll fade away pretty fast. Okay, well, those are things that, you know, the, 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 those are variables that yeah, have changed to some extent. What are the, let's try and put that together to think about cities. So, so what are the implications of that uh, for, for, for cities? I want to make uh, four, four points quickly. Uh, two arguing that cities will do pretty well out of it, um, and, and two uh, suggesting areas of damage. Okay, so the first one, yeah, cities are that old trade-off between the benefits of high productivity and amenity, but above all, yeah, high productivity, the basic facts here, uh, big cities are 40, 50, 60% more productive um, than, than, than other areas. So cities are a trade-off between high productivity and the costs of being in the city. And the fundamental cost is the cost of commuting, right? And some of that you know, shows up in land prices and things, but the fundamental cost uh, is, is the cost of commuting. Well, if you think what I said a moment ago about changes in uh, work practices, what's happened? We've just halved the cost of commuting. You know, you're only going to have to go into the office three days a week. You're going to have to go in sometimes, but um, yeah, if you're going in three days a week, then we've just... Um, yeah, held up the benefits of cities. The productivity effect is still there, but we've just halved the cost. So great, you know, <laughs> cities should be benefiting from this. Well, there, there, there are other factors, but I think yeah, the simple economic analysis cuts the opposite way of some of the journalistic stuff. It's um, you know, the, the changing, the adoption of technology, the changing work practices actually uh, make cities um, in, a, in a real sense, more attractive, not, not less attractive. Second reason why cities will you know, do, you know, can continue to do well is this point about you know, the built structures are there. You know, major town centre office blocks in Melbourne are not going to become empty. Yeah, maybe their rents will go down a little bit. Or maybe not on my previous argument, but yeah, maybe they'll go down. But importantly, if, you, if you've got this fixed capital stock, you're not going to have on the whole empty offices or empty apartment blocks. It's going to be price change, not quantity change. 
It's not going to be people disappearing. Um, okay, in the long run, price change might mean less building, but um, yeah, that's way out uh, given, given the longevity of uh, physical structures. So those are the two reasons why cities, well, two possible reasons uh, why cities will do, do just fine out of this. Uh, cutting the other way, just two final points. Okay, if it's a, if we've got this reduction in commuting costs, as people only have to go in you know, two or three days a week, then it obviously is of most benefit to people on long commutes rather than people on short commutes. Uh, in other words, it will be a force for sort of sprawl for, for people being more yeah, willing to commute. Yeah, not not two miles, but um, yeah, ten or fifteen miles uh, into the city. Um, I think that that is an issue. Um, it'll be slow because of the built, you know, the built structures <laughs> take a long time to change, and I think it'll probably be offset by by policy response. Um, you know, we're obviously seeing in cities already just attempts to make city centres more attractive. Um, pedestrian you know, sidewalks in, in London are being widened uh, as, as I speak. You know, new bicycle lanes are going in, trees are being planted. Um, so, so there will be that sort of policy response to make city centres um, more contagion proof and at the same time uh, more, more attractive. Um, but there is yeah, danger here of, of, of sprawl and clearly you know Australian cities are very different from from, from British cities and uh, probably more 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 prone uh, to, to, to sprawl frankly fine, fine, final point um, yeah high streets okay I've been talking from mainly about office workers you know you're still office workers will still go in what about high streets now clearly high streets are doing badly um, and clearly we've learnt even more how to do um, you know, remote shopping uh, than we have uh, remote working. Um, so I think a lot of high streets will be badly hit. Um, and that's going to vary a lot from place to place. There are going to be you know, destinations where high streets will do fine. Yeah, the centre of London or the centre of Melbourne will be fine. Um, there'll be places where high street buildings can be easily repurposed you know in oxford they'll be taken over by university or consultancies or, or, or whatever um but i think there are sort of some weaker provincial towns where the yeah, high streets will take a hit uh, the shops will be there but rents will fall a lot <laughs> and they probably won't go negative in which case you know the, the, the places may, may may stay empty so uh, I do see, do see a challenge there, particularly for some second tier uh, small time. Um, I've probably gone on too long. Let me just stop, stop at that point and then hand over to other people. Thanks. Thank you for that. We're now moving to Nadim to talk to us. Uh, can you get into the system? You're, you're okay to take over, Nadim? Uh, uh, thank you very much, John. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Cicero. But I wanted to say that um, what Tony has talked about, that physical capital will not be destroyed, I think we may be lucky because we have not built that physical capital. So quite frankly, we don't have the office space, we don't have the physical space in, in cities, and we really have to um, begin from there. So let me begin my slideshow. Um, Can everybody see the slides, please? Can you people see the slides? Yes, Nadia. You can? Okay, lovely. Yes. Okay. So my story is COVID and sprawl and slum. Because we have not built the physical capital, as I said. Um, like Tony said, we don't have that physical capital. And we don't have the congestion cost as well, because we have a sprawl. But... Most of the poor live in slums, in congestion. Not density, as Tony would like, but in slums. And it's a sad story, and I want to tell you that. But let's begin with Pakistan. <clears throat> Pakistan has been in the IMF program for the last 60 years. Our growth is declining. Our investment is low. Our fiscal and external problems remain chronic. Our health and education 
um, sectors have always lagged, despite the fact that we pump in a lot of money into them. Our remittances is what we live on. These are all deep-rooted problems, and they're getting stronger. In the middle of it, COVID has taken off, and it is very worrisome. But the more worry, worrisome thing is that we are not prepared. We have little capacity to deal with it. And our, and our cities are not made to be cities, according to the definition of Krugman, Venables, Glazer, and what have you, uh, Romer, or whatever. Our cities are not the cities that these people talk about. And we don't make our own programs. We don't make our own policies. If we had a Verifarkas, he could probably write a better book than Verifarkas, because we don't make our programs at all. So I think that's the story that we have to talk about. So what about our cities? We are sprawls for the rich and their cars. We have no space for schools and offices. We have no space for flats. We have no space for commercial offices, warehouses, et cetera, et cetera, walking, biking, et cetera. We have no public transport. So congestion costs and all the things that Tony is talking about, we are blessed not to have those. Because the rich live in, in the cities everywhere, in downtowns. There are no downtowns, really. There are crowded bazaars, very, very crowded bazaars for the poor, very, very crowded uh, communities for the poor, where six, seven, eight people live to the room. And those are tenements, those are informal structures, obviously lockdowns and doing anything out there is very, very difficult. We take street vendors, poor students, I mean, students when they live in a house, for example, they share a house, it's declared illegal. Cheap schools, which, because you can, there's only one unit, it's like a Lego block, a single family home. Everything is done in a single family home. It's converted to universities, it's converted to schools, it's converted to offices. But then, city planning says it's an encroachment. So we are in a constant legal battle with that. So I think Tony and people must understand the way our cities operate. They operate very different from, differently from your cities. And so when you say that technology might affect us, yes, technology will affect us. But our people, the people living in this one room, six to a room, and going to bazaars are hardly going to take very quickly to online shopping. And those people are hardly also going to be able to benefit from anything that technology has done because they you don't even get the kind of internet that you and I get. The government infrastructure for the internet is quite poor. So we have to take those things into account. Yet, it's not that we are not going to be affected. Our Middle East migration may return. And if they return, our remittances may decline. And that could have devastating effects for us and our cities. In any case, rural urban migration is taking place at a much slower rate because we try and slow it down. But that in itself will place pressure on our city. So these things remain there. Now, enter COVID. People in the sprawl want a lockdown. They, they're nice big houses. They want a lockdown. Uh, people like myself, people like all the other people, they want a lockdown. But quite frankly, how do you lock down in a situation where there's huge congestion and not art, um, artificial congestion that has been based by bad planning and that has been based on the fact that market demands have not been allowed to work in this economy? Uh, there is artificial dens dens density, means that people are living in these slums. So there's no social uh, distancing. So the government has been going back and forth in lockdown. And government has no capacity to deal with the situation because they unfortunately, you know, have the capacity has denuded over the years. So let's talk about where has the capacity gone. We've been building capacity for years. And I think this is something that all of you, this August panel should think about. And people like yourself should think about. Right now, the government has no reports on COVID. Data is slow in coming. We talked about deaths just now before the webinar. Um, death data is not reported. I mean, there's so much problem in data. The government is turning to the UNDP and World Bank to prepare the reports. And there's a story in there. UNDP, World Bank, and the donors prepare all our reports. We have 200 universities that have never done any policy work. They have no research value to the government. Donors, OSAID, DFID, World Bank, et cetera, et cetera, all don't want to use them. They now look like dumps out of neglect. And they themselves are now grounds for COVID because they've got 50,000 students, even some of them 30,000 students, 40,000, all in congested surroundings. And they have been closed down, but that means we'll have a huge human capital hit even though we don't have much human capital. But the key point is we've got a huge dependence in policymaking, and that's an issue. 
Please look at this cartoon. This is from 1950. 1950, people had started saying, hey, do they want us to develop? Or is it a conspiracy that somehow our capacity has to be denuded? And I think we are there. Our capacity has denuded over the years. If you go back and look at the India Office Library, we used to have capacity. If you go back and look at Ralph Prabhanti, he wrote a two volume set of books coming from, um, I think uh, one of these Midwestern University, Georgia or Purdue or something. He wrote a two volume set. He lived in Pakistan for two years on research in the bureaucracy of Pakistan. Today, I urge one of you to come here and write a book and I don't think you'll be able to even fill half a volume, even on two volumes. We talked to Gustav Papanek, who designed the early policies of Pakistan. His webinar is on, the, on, 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 Facebook, on YouTube. You can check it out. We talked about Doxyardis to another person. Doxyardis and Papanek came through Harvard. In the early 50s, the cartoon represents them. The Truman money went to Harvard. Harvard came and designed a policy, which we are still running, where the planning commission was formed and where all growth plans were formed. So I think Harvard should take responsibility for that. We have lots of degrees that are given by your universities to our officials, but they, can't, they don't have the capacity to manage the COVID. They don't have the capacity to manage our universities or our cities. So I, I don't know what we can do. We don't even have cities that we talk about. All our policies made overseas by IGC, Timonix, ASI, OPM, and many other firms and universities that get tons of our aid money and that don't even, we don't even see them here, but they make all our policies, but then you see the capacity that we've got. Okay, so here's a development story. Everybody has probably heard of Dr. Seuss. Here's Horton, here's a who. Horton is an elephant and who is some tiny mite and he's always yelling who and nobody hears him. Finally, Horton hears him and he discovers a whole new world. These poor people are yelling because, you know, hey, we're destroying their world. And this is what's happening to us here. We in PID in many various places have been writing for a long time. Where are the tower prints? Our cities are the only cities which have no tower prints. I think you will agree with me that no developing country or no country has developed without making physical infrastructure as Tony talked about. And we have no physical infrastructure because we ban it, we don't allow it. The poor, we have no space for the poor. We've been writing about it. Where is the city? What is the definition of a city? We've been writing about it because the cities are fragmented, badly built. Who runs a city? Because there's no local government. But these are things that do not concern the consultants. We've got about five World Bank projects, five ADB projects, five different projects running on these issues, but nobody talks about these issues. They talk about sanitation. They talk about how to borrow more money. And that, I think, is a huge issue. So basically, how do we solve this problem? I go back to this. This is a very important thing to bear in mind. Do we want a globalization where there is no local thought or do we want a globalization where everything comes from overseas? So our situation is this, and I will scratch it out before I show it to you. So please don't think I said this. This is just fiction. This is who we are. Our universities, our thinkers, our policy makers, they're all George Floyd. We've got a ton of people sitting on our chest, sitting on our necks, and others watching, and seminars and consultancies are happening. But we are going down the tube. And I say this because I'm sitting in the middle of a pandemic and I'm deeply worried. I'm trying to now think about how I can leave the place. This is what we feel like. Colin Kaepernick. We are taking the knee, but we are not listened to, we are not heard. Everybody tells us things without taking responsibility. And we want our consultants to come and take responsibility for the policies they suggest and the mess that has happened. The fact that we don't have any proper cities, the fact that we've got this huge artificial congestion and the fact that we've got no capacity in the government to deal with it. So I urge we are not responsible. Ghosts in the machine are responsible. We are lab rats for our cities and other experiments. Our reality, our experience does not matter. Nobody wants to listen to it, right? We are called irrational, like George, um, uh, you know, Flood, George Floyd, that, you know, we are making only noises for no reason. But that does not mean we're not suffering. The COVID is here. 
it's rampant. I hear now, your samples are not going to catch it. Even in my circle, which obviously is very, uh, you know, limited and you know, artificial, lots of people have suffered, lots of people have died. And talking to other people, lots of people are suffering and dying, and we're not even capturing them in the, in the, in the, in the figures. And hospitals are full, and medicines are not available, oxygen, oxygen is not available. It's a harsh reality. Who is going to check on that? Who is responsible for this? So my projection is, no, nothing is going to change. For us, nothing is going to change. Yes, you will have Amazon and you will have all those things. And yes, I'll go back to the US and I'll get all those things too. Here, nothing is going to change here. Here, the mess is going to get bigger. Here, the, the Middle East migrants or whatever, the migrants are going to return. It's going to get a bigger mess. And there will be no Keynes in, in the West who will do a descent like Keynes did in 1919. Um, aid is a very strong clique, and the, even though we take the knee, we can't dent the dialogue. We just can't dent the dialogue. And yes, there is a project, project ready for us. You've got the failed states project ready for us, and you people will come out with more paper. But we will start, still try like the who to be heard, and we will take the new knee. But Jim Crow prevails in development, and ladies and gentlemen, please mark that, because I don't know whether we'll be here to talk again. Um, so on behalf of my 200 disenfranchised universities, on behalf of so many Pakistani PhDs who you send back, I urge you to please bear in mind, it's not a mess of our making. Can Harvard, LSE, Oxford, MIT say the same? They've done the RCTs, they've done the experimentation, they've made the policies. It's time we called it like it is. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Nadine. That was very powerful and I'm sure uh, certainly makes me sit back and think. So I hope, I hope the same is true of our audience. Uh, our next speaker will be John Thwaites, who again will bring some evidence, I think, and some slides and hopefully will take over right now. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to Tony and thank you to Nadeem and I think we're already hearing what different perspectives there are in different parts of the world, and that's because there are going to be such different impacts. I'm going to focus on the impact of COVID-19 on cities here in Australia, and uh, to a degree in developed countries, but particularly in Australia. And uh, I really want to make five points. And the first is, that we shouldn't rush to make decisions based on uh, limited knowledge about how the pandemic is going to impact our cities. The um, newspaper articles that have already been referred to talking about the cities being dead or density is being dead, I, I think is far too premature. Uh, just on that point, certainly density uh, can be a factor in the spread of disease. But the fact that very large dense cities like Hong Kong, Taipei, Hanoi have had so few deaths demonstrates that density is not necessarily the key problem. And I think it's also worth noting that COVID-19 is now surging across rural areas of the USA. And people living in those rural areas have less access to good health care than people living in the cities. So it is in cities where the health treatment and the vaccine developments and the treatment developments are going to take place. So in my view, it would certainly be very premature to declare the city dead or to rush to policies based on that prescription. But there are other policy prescriptions that are now being put forward, which I think also may be misguided and not necessarily based on good evidence. A good example is the clamour to cut red tape and for faster planning approvals. The risk, of course, is that we'll lock in new buildings and new infrastructure, which is dangerous or unhealthy, or environmentally damaging. And I would have thought we could have drawn 
lessons from the cladding fiasco, from uh, issues we've had with uh, waste disposal here in Australia, where deregulation, lack of regulation enforcement has led to major problems for the community down the track. I also think we need to be careful about fast tracking big infrastructure projects, which seem the right thing to do for job stimulus in the short term. But if we don't properly test the business case or the environmental and social impacts, we might well regret the decision later. So in summary on this point, it's critical that whatever we do in response to COVID needs to be based on evidence. Uh, we've done this successfully in our in Australia in our health response. So why would you use the same evidence-based approach to our economic and infrastructure responses? Second point I'd make is that human behaviours are going to be critical and we shouldn't just make assumptions about how people behave. We need to actually test uh, human behaviour as it's happening and then adapt our responses based on what we find. Uh, I'm chair of Monash Sustainable Development Institute and we uh, house Behaviour Works Australia, which is a research centre, a applied research centre, focusing on behaviour change. And they have been uh, conducting a survey uh, known as the SCRUB survey, which is the survey of COVID-19 responses to understand behaviour, to examine behaviours of people here in Australia in response to the COVID pandemic. And they've been engaged by the Department of Premier and Cabinet here in Victoria to supply survey data to inform the government's uh, policies. Now, I'm just going to quickly um, refer to a few uh, slides now from, from that survey. If you And this is a survey, as, I, as I've said, uh, around Australia, and there've been four waves uh, in the last two months. It's approximately once every two weeks and about five and a half thousand Australians have been surveyed. And I just wanna focus on a few uh, responses that are relevant to our discussion today. The first is uh, people working from home and what is um, clear from the survey is that CBD, that is the central business district workers, are the ones who are much more likely to be working from home. And you know, this is quite a factor that there are many people in the suburbs who are still working and there's less of an issue for them. So in terms of city planning, it's probably gonna have a bigger impact in terms of the CBD. The next slide, uh, tells us what we already know, which is that basically the people who are working at going into work, who you largely used to go into the city by train, are now going by car. And uh, pre-COVID, 49% of people who worked in Australian CBDs commuted to work by train. Uh, now uh, we're seeing only 17% of people working in the CBD going to work by train. So essentially, you know, that bears out what we've been intuitively believing, which is that people would sw swap from public transport to the private car. Behaviour Works was asked to try to get some information about what would motivate people to go back onto public transport again. And uh, what was interesting was that the, you know, but clearly people are only prepared to use public transport if fewer people are using it. Once again, it seems obvious, but it does have a big policy implication. And essentially it means that if we're going to continue to uh, use public transport to get people to the city, we're going to have to shift uh, hours so that there are less people traveling at the peak time. But also people are very influenced by uh, 
regular sanit regular cleaning of the public transport, you'll see that's a, a, a major factor. And by reducing the maximum passenger uh, density, essentially by blocking off rows of seats. So there are some practical things that can be done to incentivize people to get back onto public transport. The other thing that was interesting was when we asked people uh, what would influence them to shift their uh, time of use of, pu of public transport, uh, once again, to get people off the peak, um, the peak public transport. Now, certainly discounting off-peak um, transport costs was a factor. But by far the biggest factor was if my employer directed me to start or end work at off peak times. Now this also has a big implication because many of the questions that were asked had answers that showed that the role of employers is going to be critical in planning for the recovery. If employers allow flexibility, they support and encourage their workers uh, in job flexibility, then uh, we're, we're going to be able to get through this period and have the uh, people travel at different times. Final slide uh, referred to here is just an interesting one where people were asked their perceived risk and people see that public activities and work is quite a risk, whereas social contact with friends and family is seen as not at all risky. And given that most of the um, infection trans transfer is through families and friends, this is a pretty important insight. And the implication is that as restrictions are loosened, public me messaging needs to reiterate the importance of social distancing, even at private functions with family and friends. So that was the slides that I uh, wanted to uh, refer to. And I just briefly now like to uh, deal with the other points I wanted to make. Uh, first is that COVID will have direct and indirect impacts on cities. And we've talked about the direct impacts such as um, different uh, working patterns, uh, the health impacts, and they will have impacts on transport, housing, energy, and social impacts. Uh, Tony talked about the impact uh, in transport on the reduction in commuting costs, which is obviously a good thing if people work from home a couple of days a week. But that will also have a huge impact on uh, the need to build new infrastructure because that infrastructure is uh, driven by peak demand. And by cutting the peak demand through these more flexible work practices, we'll have an opportunity to defer some of this very expensive public transport and road infrastructure that we're now undertaking. And given the massive debt that governments are going to face, that is quite an important insight. But there'll be also some less obvious uh, impacts, and I'll just refer to one, which is energy. Uh, people will be working from home during the day, and that will no doubt increase the demand for distributed power for solar PV, which will be providing energy during the day at home when people need it, whereas now it's uh, largely wasted. So I think this will provide an even bigger stimulus for that local um, solar PV power. I also want to touch on an indirect impact that we haven't talked about, which is going to be huge in its impact on cities in Australia. And that is migration. I mean, it's uh, estimated that overseas migration is likely to reduce by 85% next year. Now, even if it uh, you know, gradually comes back, that will have a major impact on our city because essentially Melbourne and Sydney and indeed many of our regional centres have been dri driven by immigration. It's driven the housing market, it's driven construction, it drives uh, many of our businesses. And I saw today a, a report from the Mitchell Institute that said international students make up more than 30% of the population in some of Melbourne's suburbs. 
once again, having a huge impact on the local economy. So in my view, migration and the change in migration uh, will be one of the biggest impacts on our cities. Next point that I want to make is that despite COVID, we're still going to have a number of other big challenges which we have to address, particularly climate change, environmental degradation and inequality in our cities. And just to point out that in Australia, transport carbon emissions are nearly 20% of Australia's emissions and they're the fastest growing source of our emissions. I chair Climate Works Australia and we've recently produced a report based on modelling of the CSIRO that sets out what Australia needs to do to meet a net zero target. And essentially one of the factors is we need 50% of new car sales in 2030 to be electric vehicles. Now, unfortunately in Australia, we have a tiny percentage of electric vehicles. And unless we start now, we're going to be unable to put a lid on these fast growing transport emissions and meet our climate targets. But also in the context of COVID where uh, people are likely to uh, move to a degree from public transport to vehicles, it's absolutely vital that we focus on the need to grow our electric vehicle uh, market. There are, on the other hand, a number of positives though, I think, in a disruption like this. And I think a good example is cities around the world who are already turning uh, road space into bike lanes or walking space, turning car parks into uh, little parklets, changing local planning laws to promote active transport and doing more to promote safe active transport, which people will be looking for uh, during the COVID recovery. The final point that I want to make is that the COVID-19 recovery needs to be multidimensional and the sustainable development goals are a very good framework for a multidimensional recovery. The goals set broad criteria that can be adopted as we design our recovery policies. And I would hope that uh, all governments in Australia and companies use the goals as a framework for planning better cities, but also safer and healthier ones. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we've had, had three speakers and we've got a couple of questions. I just thought it might be opportune to ask Tony to say something about uh, Nadim's contribution, given that Tony's been working on cities I know in Africa, which have uh, a number of the, uh, the same sorts of issues. Tony, are you willing to, uh, to say something about that or should we just go to other questions? Yeah, I'd be happy um, please, to please. Uh, a few comments. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, yeah, no, that was, that, was, that was very interesting. I mean, obviously, John and I spoke uh, essentially from a uh, the, the developed country standpoint. I mean, undoubtedly, there's a real disaster unfolding in a, in a lot of developing country cities. Um, the World Bank's doing some quite interesting stuff, um, really pointing to the fact it's not density per se uh, that's, that's a problem. Um, the, the, um, the COVID hotspots are density and poverty, uh, put them together. So it, it's density and very poor quality housing. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's, uh, it's the slum, it's the favela. Uh, getting it. So it's, 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 not, it's not density itself, it's, it's, it's density and poverty. Um, but two, two, two things I did want to say on that. First, I mean, yeah, okay, three things. There's a disaster un, un, unfolding and you know, no, no way do I want to play that down. But there are also real learning going on 
in how to manage the health aspects of this. Um, I mean, the World Bank stuff on identifying hotspots, I think is, is, is quite interesting. Um, been talking to people in Ghana who have been very successfully um, rolling out mass testing. And the way they're doing the testing is, is pooling. So you test a group of, um, you sort of pull the samples from you know, 30 or 50 people uh, and, and, and test that. And then they're managing really rapid turnaround. So within 24 hours, you know, if anyone in the pool um, you know, is infected and then you can drill down. Um, so I think, you know, again, learning by doing is really important. Um, so there will be learning about how to identify hotspots, do the testing, uh, do the tracing, do the contact stuff, which is not to downplay the unfolding disaster, but, but it's important that there's that learning. A lot of what Nadim said was about, I think, th th think about governance. Um, yeah, it is really important that, you know, citizens, uh, everyone recognises uh, that cities are places of public goods and public bads. And if you have an environment with public goods and public bads, you need effective governance. It's absolutely essential. Um, so if you know one lesson that could come out of this is you know, build capacity in local government, uh, that would uh, be really, really important. And let me remind people um, that it was cholera in London, I mean, um, yeah, de 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 yeah. The, the life expectancy in London for centuries was about 15 or you know, 20 years less than life expectancy in the rest of the country. We sort of moved to London to die, basically, or to get rich then die. Um, it was the health crises of the mid 19th century that created effective local government in London. Yeah, the Metropolitan Board of Works was set up in response to the great stink uh, when people had to, when Parliament had to move out because the smell was too bad. So, um, yeah, really recognising the importance of local governance and using, using this as an opportunity to build capacity. Uh, it's really, really important. Thank you, Tony. Um, the question that I have in front of me is, is to, again to Nadim about the sharing of the responsibility for the governance failures that Tony's just referred to. I mean, is it really only donors who, or is it partic particularly donors? It just felt a little bit as if it was only donors. And I guess that's the thrust of, of, of one of the comments that I've received or questions I've received. Um, yeah, how broad, I mean, to what extent a country is responsible for these things as opposed to uh, uh, solving their own problems as opposed to having other people tell them how to do it. I think that was, that's the thrust of the question. So Nadim, can you have a go at that? Yeah, and, uh, let me answer that if I can. Sure, uh, I think it goes back to what Tony just said, that there's a real learning moment. But I also noticed what he said, that the World Bank is learning. My question is, can we learn? There are 200 universities with about 2 million students. Are we going to let them learn or is it just the World Bank who's going to learn? Is it the global institutions that are going to learn? Is it the aid institutions that are going to learn? Then obviously what you're doing is you're disempowering the local institutions. I checked yesterday with some of my major thinkers. How many government reports have been written in the last 20 years? And the reports that I, that I was given were all written by the donors. Right? I mean, for example, um, look at just now what's happened. The Planning Commission is asking UNDP and the World Bank to write reports on COVID. Not the government, not our local departments. IGC, Tony Venables has been a part of IGC. IGC has been writing our reports. So look, you're absolutely right, it's our responsibility. Just like it's the responsibility of the blacks in America. But the question is, can you deny the fact that the blacks have been discriminated against or is it their responsibility? I think that's the point that I'm trying to make. We take the knee because, hey, we have had 70 years of capacity erosion. This is despite the fact that you have created PhDs like me and many others, but there's no capacity locally. 
and our universities, as I said, I speak on their behalf. They are sitting there totally disenfranchised. They are not asked for anything. So my take to my students, I had a webinar yesterday with my students. I address a lot of student gatherings and I tell them, forget it, don't get educated. This is not in your domain. You should go out and become workers somewhere because you get educated, you'll only be sitting in, in, in second rate positions and doing nothing because they will not allow you to make policy. So yes, it's our fault, but please give us room. That's all I'm saying. And clearly, clearly governance is important. Um, so the other qu next question I had was for John. John, there was some tension in your presentation. You, say, you argued or you presented data saying that people didn't trust public transport and increasingly wanted to use their cars. Uh, Tony, I think, talked about uh, how uh, long-term, long-distance commuting is going to be more attractive. Uh, but you then said, well, we should reduce the number of car space and increase the room for bicycles. Uh, is there a tension between people wanting to use, as a result of this experience, cars, and we're doing the exact opposite in our policy? Well, you, we won't be able to use cars because if everyone who works in the city travel by car, they're not going to get there. They're just going to be sitting in the car all day and zooming from the car. So uh, this is you know, probably one of the main reasons we are still in uh, a situation where most of the CBD workforce is working from home because you could, they, there isn't space for them to come by car and they're not prepared and we don't want them all to come at the same time on public transport. Now, active transport is an alternative. Uh, there are a lot of people who, uh, who live uh, near the city who, if there was good bicycle access, would travel by bike, as we see in so many parts of Europe. I mean, Melbourne is perfect, but uh, it's a safety nightmare uh, to actually get through the city with the current configuration. So I think turning those current car parks into bike lanes would be one way to get more people back to work and get them doing it in a healthy way. Yeah, if I can come in, I find, I mean, John's behavioral stuff um, really, really interesting and actually rather optimistic. Um, yeah, it did suggest that, that people would be willing to um, you know, get, get back on public transport uh, fair, fairly rapidly, I thought. Um, you know, the proportion, I mean, it would take some measures on it not being too crowded, you know, flexibility in time. Um, but I, I, I took a rather sort of optimistic message from that. And obviously, particularly because it's such a short run, short run measure. I mean, if people are, yeah, showing any willingness to get back on public transport now, then hopefully in six months or a year's time, um, yeah, I took quite a positive message from it. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the issue for me is that the design of our city is that the, the suburbs that I work on are sort of 25 kilometres from the CBD. And so those people are probably not going to ride bicycles. So the, the infrastructure, the design of the city, the hard infrastructures, not really set out and it seemed to some extent that's the same issue in, in, in Pakistan that the cities are not designed to, to um, allow the sorts of activity that, that you want in the locations you want it in. Uh, so Tony, did the value of all those houses go down as well in all the, the other suburbs? Or John, I guess. Well, uh, yes, the value of houses will, will go down uh, for no other reason than that. The reason I talked about it around migration. Migration has driven uh, a lot of the market for greenfield housing. Uh, it's you know, basically the demand's just not going to be there. What may happen is that the developers will just hold back land for a while. But I suspect that uh, there will be a decline in, in all values because of that. And we, we've been growing at the rate in Melbourne of a million people every eight years. And that's a huge, huge growth rate. And uh, that uh, has driven the, the construction industry and house prices. <laughs> okay, now I'm, I'm sort of questions, gentlemen, so I'm, I'm gonna keep running with some of these if I can. Um, we saw with telephony, 
that mobile telephones allowed uh, many countries to bypass the older infrastructure and build something different. Do the communications technologies we have available today allow cities like Lahore to be built differently or some African cities to be developed differently to the way they have been in the past? Are you asking me? Okay. Uh, either Tony or Nadim, I guess one of the development people. Sure. Um, John, uh, I think telephony is very important and it has permeated Pakistan uh, to the extent of almost 80% of the people have cell phones now. But I think we also require a uh, sort of supporting infrastructure. As I said, internet speeds are very important. Um, the second thing that's also very important, other legislative infrastructure, for example, payment technology. We have a kind of a payment technology locally, but we don't have any global interface. So many people who are trying to earn through um, the, the internet cannot uh, do, the, do so because they don't have uh, the payment gateways like PayPal or something. So the government has been taking the last 10, 11 years to try and develop that, and I don't know whether we are close to it or not. Secondly, for example, track and trace, yes, the cell phones allow track and trace for COVID, and that kind of uh, infrastructure, again, we, we know that our mobile companies, I've talked to them, AIG does a lot of work on COVID, so we've done a lot of work on this, and we've talked to the mobile companies, they can do it, they can give you the track and trace data. Then the government has to have the capacity to be able to use it and run with the data. The data is available. The fact that I'm talking to, to you on Zoom is recorded somewhere in, 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 in the uh, sphere. But the government has to have the capacity to use it. So there are so many other things like this. For example, we are teaching by Zoom. I'm teaching by Zoom these days. But the problem is that uh, in many parts of the country, especially outside the main cities, internet speeds are so slow that we can't use Zoom. So there's a built-in inequality that's arising now because all the students out there, sitting out there are complaining, hey, I can't do it. Now I'm in a big quandary. Should I discontinue it for the people who have access to the internet or should I uh, you know, do it for them and disadvantage what is? So it's going to need to inherit disadvantages unless we have a good policy supporting infrastructure. You talk about, for example, um, uh, e-commerce. But e-commerce also requires a supporting delivery mechanism. In Pakistan, delivery mechanisms still need to be built. The post office, which used to be built, is now kind of dead. Other private services have come up, but they're still evolving. They take time. They take five, six, seven days to deliver, out of, uh, you know, one day or two days. So these things are happening. So the fresh vegetable people are trying to. We talked the other day, I had a webinar with our people who do fresh vegetables. And they are struggling, but they can only do it in Lahore, Karachi now. They can't go further. And this thing will, there is, people are evolving, but it's going to take a long time. And meanwhile, we have to live with what we've got. Yeah. Uh, Tony, is the African experience different? I mean, there was a lot more early experimentation with payment systems in countries like Kenya. Yeah, I'm mean, clearly that was, you know, leap, leapfrogging on. Telecommunications. Uh, sorry, I'm going to. I was going to leapfrog on telecommunications um, and then payment systems. Um, yeah, just, just again, I'm not, I don't know the answers to this, obviously, but just trying to think from first principles. You know, will, will it allow cities to be built differently? You know, think of a developing country city that's probably chronically congested, right? Absolutely you know, hid hideous traffic congestion in you know, Dakar or, 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 or wherever. Um, and ask, you know, if communications technology, you know, Zoom and everything gets, you know, improves and becomes widely adopted, is that good or bad for that city? Well, to me, it you know, seemed pretty unambiguously good if, 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 if you know, the number of, you know, the, we, we want the connectivity, activities that take place in cities thrive on connectivity, but if that connectivity requires less getting in your car and um, cogging things up, and some fraction of it can be done uh, remotely, then that, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm repeating my main point. To me, that, that is really, really strengthening, strengthening cities. Now, does it mean they'll be built differently? Does it mean, I don't know. Does it mean there'll be a number of sub-centers 
uh, it will make subcenters more attractive relative to the CBD. I'm not sure it does, does it? I mean, it's, you know, if you're only going into work two days a week, the CBD becomes easier to get to. Um, so I, I, I don't know, but just, you know, when I really you know, you look at a really congested developing country city, yeah, if we have a technology that enables connectivity without that travel, great. Um, that, that's my sort of basic take on it. And looking at it from a developed uh, well, developed cities point of view, information technology has been extraordinarily beneficial during this period. Like without it, uh, how could we have kept so, so much going? Uh, the universities, the fact that the universities uh, have all switched to online and largely continued to supply what they did before is just extraordinary. And it couldn't have been done a decade ago. Uh, if you look at health, telehealth within uh, a month more than three million Australians that was you know, more than 10 percent of Australia had undertaken a telehealth consultation 99 percent of GPS are now using telehealth it's radical change and once again this is something we talked about for probably 10 15 years and it's happened within a few months so you know, I think we have to look at information technology, um, as in many ways the saviour of us uh, through this period. And yeah, to, to me that doesn't undermine the city. Um, the sort of right commuting reasons we were talking about. But we haven't talked much about the, we haven't talked at all about the amenity value of your cities. You know, people want to live in the centre or in, in a city because of, you know, the five mile fall of the theatres or, or, or whatever. Um, um, well, we haven't talked about it. I guess I think that will continue. People are basically social animals um, who, who benefit from that. Yes, Cicero and I were arguing about this one, Tony. And I, and I said, well, in Aboriginal society, traditional Aboriginal society in Australia, they came together periodically for communal activities rather than living in each other's pockets. Uh, and so will we have that sort of model whereby you go to town on the weekend rather than having to be in town every day? Oops. Yeah, I think, think that that's, 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 that's possibly right. Um, so you obviously don't give up the social stuff. Um, but it, 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 it possibly becomes less frequent. I mean, thinking about this, I sometimes think, I mean, you, you all know the Dunbar number, um, that, um, what is it, an, an individual social network or sort of, you know, broader network can contain a maximum of about 140 people, right? Now, you know, the people that we can really say that we you know, know have some meaningful interaction with is about 140. But the interesting thing about the Dunbar number, of course, is if you live in a village, everyone knows the same 140 people. <laughs> it's a closed system. If you live in a city, um, you know, your, your 140 people and my 140 people um, you know, intersects just through us, not, not through the whole group. So everyone has got their own 140 linked to another. Uh, so, so you're just getting that fantastically more um, flow of information. Um, through your group knowing other groups, uh, yes. which is not the case in the village, where right? your group knows, you know, it, it's just a bubble. Uh, now, I had another question about Pakistan, and it really was about whether the existing authority structure needs to be changed, whether, in fact, uh, governance at some structural level is, is one of the major impediments. Yeah. Yes, of course, uh, John, look, uh, we need local government. And this has been a big debate here for the last 70, 80 years. We've been talking about local government. We have got nowhere near to getting local government because there are powerful forces that want to centralize uh, the issue. And that's why I said we don't even have a definition of a city. We don't even have a system. For example, I'll tell you, look, Karachi has 16 segments to it. It's a large city, it's 20 million people, 
but it has 16, I'm sorry, but no, six or seven different bits to it. And there are, for example, continuous city offices. There's Lahore, for example, has three or four segments, so it's DHA, LDA, and then MMC, et cetera. There are different conflicting jurisdictions, different cons conflicting offices. We don't have local government, so we still have the colonial civil service running the six, uh, the city. So yes, of course, that is a big issue. You have to sort it out. And that's why I said, that if the World Bank learns about cities or ADB learns about cities, it doesn't learn about this. For example, World Bank has had five projects, ADB has had five projects for the last 30 years, and they have not addressed the local government issue. They've not addressed the city jurisdiction issue. They've not addressed any of these issues. They're more concerned about projects. But I also want to address something that Tony said. Look, you, you have to understand, we in the developing world are still going through the harris todaro transformation. People are still moving from the rural areas to the cities, and that will continue. That has to happen. We have an average farm size of five acres. That means people are sitting on two, three acres, and these are totally unproductive. Those people will have to move from them, and they will go to the cities no matter what you do. Our cities are going to grow no matter what COVID or whatever. Our cities are going to grow, and they will grow rapidly. The question is, how do we make them grow? Now, regarding cars, yes, that's your problem. As far as we are concerned, 1% of the population, less than 1% of the population owns a car here. So if Karachi has 20 million people, you know, 99% of them don't have a car. In Lahore, for example, 13 million people, many people don't have a car. Yet we are building infrastructure for the car. Because, you know, World Bank, etc. wants us to build an infrastructure for the car. So we really have to have a domestic dialogue. That's why I went to the engineering university in Lahore, 100 year old university. And I asked them, look, they're building this infrastructure right outside your office. They've taken uh, university land. Do you have any say in it? They said, we have no say in it. Did you do the feasibility? No, we didn't do any feasibility. So I think these are issues that we must face. If local population is no ownership, sooner or later you'll see, yes, we will become a failed state. And yes, you can study us. Thank you. question. Uh, uh, it really is a question about um, uh, culture and, and whether it's possible to actually develop and enhance organizational cultures in structures where people don't meet frequently. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, John, whether you want to start with that one, whether, whether you can actually have influence your organization without actually meeting with people? Uh, well, partly we don't know the answer because we'll have to see what <laughs> comes out of all of this. And I mean, Zoom is only a month old. I have to say that the concept of Zoom dinner parties doesn't really excite me much. And so I do think there's something about uh, personal contact, which is different. Whether it has an ongoing impact on culture within businesses, as I say, I think it's too early. But one of the reasons cities have been so successful and why people agglomerate is because people do seem to come up with better ideas when they're around other people. And it does stimulate a positive culture of innovation and positivity. Uh, why, why does Melbourne, the CBD of Melbourne, uh, be the place where so many people want to be? It's because it's exciting, it's interesting, people feel the vibe. And so I, I think that uh, physical networking culture remains, uh, remains important. Thanks. Um, I think now I should pass back to Cicera, uh, assuming he hasn't gone to sleep. Uh, Cicera, wake up. Um, I some people were asking some questions about the announcement you made at the start as to forthcoming presentations. Can you take over, thank the speakers, and then uh, give the follow-up information? Thank you. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, thanks for uh, the moderation and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, uh, actually, all the information about uh, upcoming uh, webinars are on, the, on our website. Uh, so you could uh, go there and, and uh, get all the details. 
uh, should be uh, an, an issue. But if you contact us, if anyone uh, cannot get that information, just uh, drop us an uh, email and we'll get back. We are also uh, hoping that to send announcements to everyone who has been registered for any particular webinar. We are hoping that uh, follow-up notice will also go to them. Uh, so hopefully everyone gets uh, informed about it. Um, yeah, given the time, I will uh, I want to thank uh, everybody, uh, Rod, Tony, Nadine, John. Um, I mean, I had almost forgotten that uh, Tony is actually now part of uh, Monash as well, because mm -hmm. kind of came over and then uh, we're just going to catch up and maybe have a glass of wine and then he got on a plane and went back to hibernation in Oxford. Um, so, uh, and it has been uh, also, yeah, a pleasure to engage uh, with Nadim. I uh, know that Nadim's views on this are, are never going to be bland. Um, I, I, had, uh, I had occasion to interact closely with Nadim when he was IMF president rep in uh, Sri Lanka. And I think we used to argue till midnight and past midnight uh, and as a good compassionate Muslim he may kept me supplied with the right uh, things to keep conversations going. So uh, this is a uh, you know it's a uh, I suppose uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that even though it's a global calamity that uh, this has brought uh, people together to talk uh, and engage in dialogue about really important issues uh, and uh, uh, we are also very happy that uh, we are forging more partnerships both within the university we yeah, you know we would get closer to interacting with John's uh, group that we occasionally have contact with but uh, uh, this has uh, deepened that and then with uh, with uh, Nadim's uh, institution and other institutions around the region and uh, we hope that uh, this activity will enable us to, uh, you know, build better the relationships of uh, academic debate and dialogue and uh, take forward uh, uh, these relationships that we are forged where, as we confront uh, bigger and newer challenges. Uh, um, so with that, I want to thank everyone again. Um, please take care. Uh, the disease is still with us. Uh, it hasn't gone away, uh, but we all hope that uh, uh, we'll, we'll be able to do a postmortem on this uh, and go on to nicer things to talk about in the future. Thank you all.